Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for all that you are accomplishing tonight through your word. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you for some, times about, some time about the subject of redemption and about our covenant with God. We have one more message we're going to share tonight, and that is on the subject of understanding the redeeming work of the vengeance of the covenant. God has a vengeance of the covenant, and we must understand this. Isaiah 63, verse 4, For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. God is a God who has redeemed us, and he's also a God of vengeance, who will take vengeance against his enemies. We see in the first coming of Jesus Christ, he came to bring salvation. In his redeeming work, there was an aspect of redemption, as far as the venge vengeance part, by conquering what Satan had accomplished, destroying the work of the enemy through going to the cross, being made sin, going down to hell for three days and three nights, paying that price, having accomplished the redemption, being the firstborn from the dead, then taking back the keys of hell and death as he was born from the dead so that you and I could be born from the dead. And he also came to destroy the works of the enemy. Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is the work of the Lord. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which was the year of Jubilee, when everybody went free from their bondages. Jesus came to set us free from all of our spiritual bondages, to heal us and deliver us and set us free. There is another aspect, though, to the ministry of Jesus. And this is seen in the second coming of Jesus, when he will bring judgment upon his enemies, which is the vengeance of the Lord. This has been quoted from Luke, Luke 4, from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God. That comes in the second coming, when he is going to bring vengeance upon his enemies. At the same time, the vengeance of the Lord also operates during the New Testament era against the enemies. We see this, when they, even from the Old Testament, when these things happen. In Joshua chapter 10, in verse 13, Here's where the sun stood still, the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves. They took vengeance upon their enemies. God gave them the victory. In fact, the sun stood still as they continued to fight until the enemies were smitten and destroyed. That shows you that the vengeance of the Lord is the destruction of the enemies. And it's, it works in your life personally because God wants to destroy all the spiritual enemies, which is all the evil spirits and all their works arrayed against you. Now, one thing we have to know, people are not our enemies that we bring vengeance against. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. We don't take vengeance against people. We are to walk in love towards every person. And that is so, of course, in the New Testament, the higher law, where we walk in love even to our enemies. In Romans chapter 12, we see in verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, talking against people that would be used of the enemy as destructive vessels. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, <clears throat> saith the Lord. God will repay the enemies. He is the one who is the judge. We're talking about people that have been used of the devil, that have done destructive things against you. At the same time, there is a vengeance that we have 
and the vengeance is against the spiritual enemies in our life. We see, we'll see many scriptures that show this vengeance that God is taking in bringing his ongoing and redeeming work. We talked about redemption just wasn't just Jesus going to the cross. It wasn't just one thing. It's an ongoing work in our life. It was occurring throughout the Old Testament era and defeating their enemies, and it occurs in our life. As we look at these scriptures, and we look at them from a New Testament point of view by the types, we see in Isaiah 35, verse 4, Say to them that are of a fear, fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. God's the one that brings the vengeance against your enemies. He's the one who will come and save you and deliver you and set you free. There are conditions to be met. You cannot have fear and give place to the enemy. And you must be strong. God wants you strong in the Lord. You need spiritual strength to conquer the enemy, and you cannot fear. Fear will give place to him to work against you in your life. At the same time, you aren't going to see the vengeance against your enemies if you walk contrary to the Word of God, because you must also understand the vengeance of the covenant is not only against your enemies, but it's also against those who would be enemies against him. And who becomes an enemy against him? The ones that walk in the ways of sin and do not do what he says. Leviticus 26, 15. If you shall despise my statutes or if your soul abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments but that you break my covenant. If we don't do his word, we break covenant. What's going to happen? There is going to be a vengeance of the covenant. We see down in verse 23. If you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, they wouldn't come to repentance, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. God expects us to confess our sins, repent, and turn from them. If not, he doesn't wink at sin anymore. The judgment will come because of sin. He goes on and says, and I'll bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. Avenge the quarrel. And this word quarrel really means vengeance. It should have been translated vengeance. I'll show you. I got the cursor over it for you here the first time. In the lower window, there's information about the particular word. This word means vengeance. It's been translated vengeance 15 times. One time avenge out of the 17 times it's used. One time quarrel erroneously. Young's, Young's literal translation, the one we put below, corrects it. He means that he shall avenge the, the vengeance of my, he'll bring this avenging again on the vengeance of my covenant. Which is what? Because of disobedience. You see, not only will God bring vengeance on our enemies, but he also is a just God. He's going to bring vengeance on those that walk in contrary to his word and break covenant. Notice, he said, the pestilence is going to come upon you and be delivered in the hand of the enemy. What happens when we, give, when we walk in sin? We give place to the devil. And we will see the enemy have place in our life. This is why we must understand that you are to obey God's word. If you disobey, certainly, you will see the vengeance of the covenant because God's a performer of his word. Remember, if we obey, blessings come on us and overtake us. But if we disobey, then curses will come upon us as well. And we see this just wasn't something in the Old Testament. This is also in the New Testament. God is a just God, and he will perform his word. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if we sin willfully after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins to get out of this, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Judgment would come because of sinning willfully. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. They saw judgment. Of how much sore punishment suppose you thought he be worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, when we sin, we essentially are trodden underfoot the Son of God, not doing His Word. 
and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and holy thing, because the blood washed away our sins. And now we're going to walk in the ways of sin? That'd be wrong. And in done despite, the word despite means insult. Insult to the Spirit of grace. See, God has set you free through Jesus Christ, and now you are dead to sin. You are now to walk in the ways of the Lord. You are to walk uprightly. You're a servant of righteousness now and to be obedient to his ways. Notice what he goes on and says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, which means pay back. I will repay. That's why you and I do not retaliate against people. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. That certainly puts the fear of God before us because we want to be sure that we don't walk in the ways of sin because a judgment certainly will come. He goes on and says, a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Now, God doesn't want to bring these things. Remember, he delights in mercy, not in judgment. If you and I will walk in the ways of the Lord, we will see God's blessings. Now, this also means that we must deal with sin and conquer it in our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 7, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, it speaks of what is necessary in our life when we have sinned so that we can get this thing right and get it underfoot. We must have a godly sorrow. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not the repentant of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world is just because I've been caught at something or i got a bad situation now because of something. No, we should have a godly sorrow that we sin before God that works true repentance so we turn away from it. And then he brings forth many things that are important to show true repentance and seeing the fact that you're, you're doing what God expects you to do. And it involves you having a revengeful attitude against sin, against the devil, against your enemy, and crushing this sin under your foot. Look what it says in verse 7. For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. That's the first thing we need to do. Have a godly sorrow. So we'll come to true repentance, changing our mind and turning away from it. And what carefulness it wrought on you. The word carefulness is a word which is the word spode in the Greek, which means diligence, earnestness, diligence in doing something. Young's corrects this. Carefulness is not the best translation. What diligence it wrought in you, indicating that you and I must have diligent effort, earnest, diligent effort to deal with the sinful situation. We can't just think they're just going to slide by and just let them go away, supposedly on their own. No, we've got to take it to the enemy. We have to make changes. Making changes is absolutely important. That shows that you have really repented and turned away from the sin. What clearing of yourselves? Clearing of yourselves means you're going to do whatever is necessary to get yourself right before the Lord. Now you're going, to, you're going to do all the things that the Word says so you don't continue in this sin any longer. Otherwise, you know that judgments are going to come because God's a God who has to perform His Word, and He's not going to compromise it. What indignation? This shows the fact that you're going to have an indignation or an irritation against the sin that you committed, how the devil got you into sin. You should have, have such an irritation against the sins that you have committed that you come to the place of having a hatred for it, that you don't take it lightly. You, it, you know, you're going to deal with this thing and get this thing put underfoot in your life. And then he goes on also and he says, what fear? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And by the fear of the Lord, people depart from iniquity. They turn from it because they know that judgments are going to come. And also the fear of the Lord, as we'll come back to this in a moment, it's shown by changes in your life. Someone can't just say, I, I confess my sins and I repent and turn from them and then not have change. <laughs> that, they're just trying to pull somebody, so they pull the wool over their eyes, you know. Psalms 55, 19 it says in the second part of this verse, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. If you really have the fear of God, you will hate the evil, you will depart from iniquity, 
and you will have the changes. You will turn away and you will not continue in any of these, these sinful ways any longer whatsoever. We go back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. Then it says, What vehement desire. This means a longing, a strong desire to want to do what's right. I am going to get myself established in the Word, so I am walking in the Word. I'm not going to give place to this. I'm going to change. I'm going to get the Word in me. I'm going to get my mind renewed. I'm going to get my will set. I'm going to make the proper choices to do what God wants. What zeal. This is where you're zealous. Hey, you're not going to be lazy. You're not going to be slothful. You're not going to just, you know, think things are going to go away. You're going to be zealous. You're going to be after this thing to make sure that you do not give place to this sin again. You're going to correct the problems in your life. But revenge, and this is part of what we do, of revenging or a vengeance against the enemy, which means you're going to come against the devil who you give place to, and you're going to be ready to resist all the temptations, cast out all these spirits, conquer every attack that the enemy would bring against you, and make sure that you never give place to the devil again. It means you're going to get the word in you. You're going to make, put the word first place. In all things, you've approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Otherwise, these are all factors that are involved. Godly sorrow, diligence, clearing yourself, making sure that you have gotten rid of this, indignation against it, fear of the Lord, so you understand you're going to see judgment if you don't change, vehement desire and longing desire, strong desire with zeal to get rid of this situation, put it underfoot, and a revenge against the enemy. That's all out attack, so you're not going to give place to the sin whatsoever. If a person has those kind of attitudes and they carry out the word, they're going to get rid of all the sins in their life. They're going to make sure they get the word in them and do what needs to be done. Another aspect of this revenge that our part is, so we don't get place to the enemy, is in the area of the mind. How does the devil work at you? He tries to work at you through the mind, through thoughts that come. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations, mental reasonings, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Any wrong thoughts that are contrary to the word, you need to cast it down. Bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Having in a readiness, this means prepared and ready, this is because you've gotten the word in you that answers the problems, you're prepared and ready to revenge again. Now you're going to avenge the attack of the enemy coming against your mind. Not only are you going to deal with the sin area, you're going to be on guard because you've got to guard your mind. The devil will try to work at you in your mind. Now we're going to revenge all disobedience. What's the disobedience? The disobedient thoughts, the disobedient mental reasonings, the things that are coming at you contrary to the word. That's disobedience from the devil coming at you. And how are you going to be revenging the enemy successfully? When your obedience is fulfilled, our obedience to do what? Cast down the imaginations, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This means you must govern your mind. If you are going to see the vengeance of the Lord operate through you against the enemy, you're going to govern your mind with the word, not let the devil have place and take you down a road of sin by giving place to him. Another thing that we see is to defeat the enemies in our life. There are things that are necessary. Not only do we deal with sin and govern our mind and make sure we correct all the problems, we have to get on the offensive and go after the enemy as well. This is all part of the avenging work of the Lord. You have a part to play by doing what he says. Numbers 31, verse 2. Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. I told them you're supposed to get it. You're supposed to go after and conquer these enemies. After thou shalt be gathered unto my people. That's what he's speaking here. And he speaks in verse 3 and he tells them, Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war. Let them go against the Midianites and avenge the Lord of Midian. Moses was to get these people to go into fight the battle and to avenge them of the Midianites. 
And what they have to do? They had to get armed for war. God wants you to put on the whole armor of God in the New Testament through the word in your mouth, the word in your mind, the word in your heart, and put it in operation to conquer every attack of the enemy coming against you. They all had to do it. Of every tribe, a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel, so you, so you send to the war. And so they did this, and in verse 7, they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded, and they slew all the males. They slew them all. They slew the kings of Midianite, besides the rest were slain. It lists all these guys, the five kings. They all got slain with a sword. How are you going to slay your spiritual enemies? With the sword of the Spirit, which is your mouth speaking in line with the word and smiting the enemies and seeing them be defeated, put underfoot. This was as a process. It is an ongoing process in your life to destroy every enemy that has come against you. Come against you. In getting armed, Another thing we have to do is become spiritually strong. And this is through the word in you. Psalms 8, verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength. He's ordained or established, laid the foundation of strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still, you might stop, cause to desist, the enemy and the avenger. That's the devil who's come against you. See, he has a vengeance against us. He hates us. You and I must come against him. You need to get spiritual strength because of your enemies. You'd be able to stop the enemy's attacks against you. Remember, the devil goes about seeking whom he may devour. You've got to be ready to conquer him. You're going to be defeating him, not letting him come and defeat you. So you're going to have to get spiritual strength to do this. In putting on the armor of God, we see another place where in Isaiah chapter 59, we can see how they put on the armor of God as an intercessor to be used of the Lord to conquer God's enemies. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 16, he saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness has sustained him. And that's all pointing towards Jesus, who was the intercessor for us. It tells you what an intercessor will do in the next verse. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation upon his head. That's like the armor of God, isn't it? The word in your heart, that's the breastplate, covers your heart. The word in your mind, that's the head, helmet of salvation. But also, what else did he do? He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. Meaning, as you put on the armor of God, it's not just to play a defensive warfare, it's to go after the enemy with vengeance to bring destruction upon every work of the devil that's come against you in your life. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. It takes vengeance and zeal as well as having the armor of God on to conquer the enemy. You can't be slothful, you can't be lazy, you can't be, you know, just letting things happen, whatever happens, happens kind of attitude. No, you've got to get into the fight. You've got to get into the warfare. You've got to get into the vengeance mode and get zealous to attack your enemies and destroy them. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries. He's going to use you and me to do that. God's working through us. Recompense, payback time to the enemies. To the islands, he'll pay a recompense. Otherwise, wherever these enemies are, they're all going to be destroyed through you and me using the weapons of warfare, having the strength of God, the power of God, and in the New Testament, we use the authority that's been given to us to conquer all the enemies. And that's what he wants to do. As you speak in the name of the Lord, they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When you speak, you're going to speak in the name of the Lord. It releases authority. And the glory of God is going to show up when you speak the word of God in the name of Jesus. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, of course, he will try to attack. If you think the enemy is going to lie down and give up and run, no. He is going to try to come against you. You will be challenged every step of the way. That's why you've got to get into the vengeance mode. You've got to get into the zealousness. You've got to get into the offensive posture of getting the warfare and attacking the enemy. The enemy will come in like a flood. But if you are doing what God says, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What does this lift up a standard mean? 
if you look at this word, this happened, there's different stems of the Hebrew words. This stem is called the polel stem. When we look at the usage of this, here's the polel stem meaning. It means to drive at. So when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall drive against him. He's going to drive against the devil. Because you're going to put him in operation. And it doesn't matter what the enemy does. He may come at you, but you're going to come against him. You can never get in fear or draw back or throw in the towel or give place to him or not come against him. You need to rise up and come against the enemies and tromp on them and see them be put underfoot. Meaning, you've got to get on the offensive. And of course, the intercessor, we know our enemies, our spiritual enemies. Remember, this is putting on the armor of God. So we get strong and have the power of his might through putting on the armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And verse 12 tells us why we need to do it, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against people, but against the principalities and against the authorities. Powers means authorities. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The world means age. Against the spiritual wickedness in the high places. These are the evil spirits. Your warfare is a spiritual warfare against spiritual enemies. What did they do in the Old Testament? They got on the offensive and went after their enemies. That's exactly what God wants you to do. 2 Samuel 22, verse 38. I have pursued my enemies. I've run after them with hostile intent. And I've destroyed them. And turn not again until I have consumed them. You need to get into the warfare mode on all these areas. Not only in getting rid of the sin, dealing with the sin, coming to true repentance, seeing the change, governing your mind, but then get on the attack against the enemies to drive them out of your life. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I'd consumed them. That's why you're going to be casting out continually to drive all these enemies out until they're all gone. I consumed them and wounded them, but they could not arise. Yea, they're fallen under my feet. And remember, they're not going to give up. You're going to use authority and power to conquer them and see them be smitten. That's what had to happen. That's how they got fallen under his foot. That was girding with strength the battle. God strengthened you for the battle through the word. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. God's doing the work. Thou hast given me the necks of my enemies that I might destroy them that hate you. Hate me. Remember the devil hates you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You're going to destroy the enemy's work. You are going to see them be put underfoot. And then we come down to verse 48, and he speaks what God has done. It is God that avenged me, the one who avenged me, and smote these enemies, and brings down the people under me. The word says vengeance here. You see the word give there, but there's another word down below here, which is the word vengeance. The Lord who is giving vengeance to me would be more literally the way this means. God's giving vengeance to me to bring these enemies underfoot. As you go into the spiritual warfare and fight and conquer the enemies, that's God giving his vengeance unto you. That's the vengeance of the covenant against your enemies to be them be smitten. We see something else over in Psalms. Psalms 149. Otherwise, we're going to take it to the enemy. If you won't engage in the warfare... You're going to be in trouble, that's for sure. Psalms 149, verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Ah, they're going to be praising and worshiping God, bringing the manifest presence of God. They're going to be ready to go forth to speak the word, smite the enemy with a sword, which we do with our mouth to smite the enemies. And what are they doing? To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. He bring destruction against them. That's what God will do to our enemies. He wants you to be a praiser and worshiper and get in the presence of God and get that mouth in operation, smiting your enemies to execute the vengeance upon the enemies, the devils that are, have caused destruction in your life. And you need to get after them. Luke chapter 18. 
In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. The word ought really means it's necessary. It really is, it's been translated must the majority of the times, we'll show you. Out of the times, of the 106 times, it's translated must. If you look it up in Strong's Concordance, it says necessary is binding. So it's something we must do that's necessary as binding. Men must, necessary as binding, a covenant word, always pray and not to faint. When you pray, you are putting God in operation. You are releasing Him to accomplish His word, whether it's bringing promises or destroying the works of the devil. And we cannot faint. You faint, that's someone who gives up and throws in the towel. We can't be doing that. It speaks about a city, in a city a judge that feared not God, neither regarded man. This is a parable showing you something that's, that you need to realize. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. So, this is all pointing towards someone coming to see the enemies be smitten underfoot. He would not for a while. Afterward, he said with himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, this widow troubles me. I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. She was continually after these enemies to be avenged, avenge the enemies that were arrayed against them. Hear what the unjust judge said. Shall not, she said, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto them, though he bear long with them? He will. He will avenge us, who are the ones that are chosen because we're walking in his ways. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Otherwise, he, she got avenged because she continually come in. This ju judge finally decided he'd go along with it. Well, we have a just judge, and he is ready to fight for us. The battle's the Lord's, and the victory is ours. And he is ready to crush the enemies under our foot. He will avenge us speedily. What was the mark about this lady, though? She was continually coming for this to be done. In the New Testament, we have authority. You're to be continually putting God in operation by attacking the enemies, by casting out, by using the weapons of warfare, by putting forth the, the word, the, see the vengeance of the Lord come against all of your enemies. That is what he wants. And what, was it, what did we see? It said you're, not, you're supposed to always pray and not to faint. So we're going to pray prayers of authority and prayers that are going to conquer the enemies. We're never going to faint or draw back. We're going to continually attack the enemy until he's put underfoot. We're also, he's looking to see if people are going to be in faith. We're going to be in faith. And what God wants, he wants you to have a faith that will not be denied. I will not be denied faith. That's a type of faith. Not one that's going to try it and see if something works and then throw in the towel. No, your faith will bring you the victory. You need to have a faith that will not be denied. I continually stay on the offensive to attack all my enemies and see them be put underfoot. Now, at the same time, you certainly can't be giving place to the enemy in any way and think that the vengeance of the Lord against your enemies will occur. It's not going to happen. Jeremiah 11, verse 20. O Lord of hosts that judgest righteously, he's a righteous God, that triest the reins and the hearts. The rain speaks of your emotions and affection. It speaks of the soulish realm. He's testing, trying your soul and also your heart. Find out whether you're right. Let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. He brought his cause to him. And if your heart and your soul is right with the Lord, he will, you will see the vengeance against the enemy. But you've got to be right. He judges righteously. If you've got sin in the camp, you can't win your battles. Remember when, they, when Achan had sinned, they couldn't fight. He says, you, you can't win your battles, but there was sin in the camp. You must have yourself right or you're not going to win anything. Another thing. Jeremiah chapter 50, if we're going to see the vengeance of the Lord against our enemies, we got to come out of the things of this world that are not of God. Jeremiah 50 verse 14, put yourself in array against Babylon round about. 
all that bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Or to get rid of all that's of Babylon. Shout against her round about. She's given her hand. Her foundations are fallen. Her walls are thrown down. It's the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance upon her as she has done. Do unto her. And that vengeance will happen in the end when he destroys Babylon, mystery Babylon. But the principle is this. What's Babylon all about? It's the world system. It's the false system. It's contrary to God. It's false. In anything of the world, you are in Babylon. If you are walking according, you're involved with worldly things, you've, you've, you're allowing Babylon to run you. You've got to turn away from all the things of the world. Anything that is not of God, anything that's not in line with His Word, is you. You're in Babylon. You're to flee out of it. Because he, it's the vengeance of the Lord that is going to destroy everything, the world system, anything of the world. In fact, someone who's got uh, themselves hooked in with the ways of the world in any aspect, you're in trouble. In fact, God considers you an adulterer, an adulteress, meaning you have committed spiritual separation from God. James 4.4, 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is an enemy, enmity with God. Whoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We can't have the things of the world. You shouldn't be involved in the things of the world. If you're involved in the things of the world, you're a spiritual adulterer. Are you think you're going to get anywhere? I mean, can you be watching TV that's not bringing the Word of God into you? Can you be watching movies that are not feeding you the Word of God? No, you're pouring filth into you. Can you be involved in worldly things? Can you be involved in, in all kinds of stuff out there that, oh, it's, it's, un, it's not so bad? If it's not of the Lord, it's of the world. Anything that's of the world makes you an enemy against God. God's called you out of the world. He's called you to walk a holy walk and to follow after Him. We must be separate from the world if we're going to see the destruction of our enemies in our life. We also, we see in Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah 47 verse 3. So again, speaking about Babylon. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Why is someone naked? Because they're not clothed. What will we be clothed with? With the garments of God, all the things of God that we put on. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Vengeance comes against those who are not right with God. They'll see your shame. People that are not clothed are in shame. God wants you to be clothed with the things of God, clothed with the armor of God, clothed with righteousness, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, get put off all the old man stuff, put on the new man, walk in the ways of righteousness. We must be clothed with the garments of God, and we must also conquer the sin, because people are ashamed when, from God's perspective when the enemy has dominion over them. We're to, turn, we're to conquer the enemy. He'll take vengeance. Well, God wants you to make sure that you have conquered everything in your life. We also we can't be disobedient to the laws and think that we're going to see the vengeance. Instead, remember, there's a vengeance for those who break covenant. Romans 13, 4. Here it's talking about, back here, how rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And it speaks of the fact that we're not to resist the authority or resist the ordinance of God. If we do resist them, we receive damnation, which is judgment. He says, talking about the one who's a ruler, he's a minister of God to thee for good. If thou do that which is evil, be afraid. That'd be breaking the law. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He's a minister of God, a revenger. That's the one who avenges and exacts the penalty, the vengeance of the covenant to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. If you and I walk in sin, we're going to see the wrath. We're going to see the execution of the judgment. And we will not see God bring victory. The enemies will be able to overcome us. We see again the same thing. we got to have dealt with sin. Jude verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, 
going after strange flesh, or set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The vengeance of the covenant is judgment that comes for those who will not walk in the ways of the Lord. And those that give themselves over to fornication, remember what happens, the whoremongers, the fornicators, end up in the lake of fire. This is the vengeance of eternal fire. And God does these things uh, based on righteousness, because he's a righteous judge. He doesn't do anything that's wrong whatsoever. You must understand that, that God never does anything that's contrary uh, to what is right. He always does things that are right. In fact, we talk about God's judge, judgment. Romans chapter 3, over here in verse 5. If our unrighteousness commends the righteous of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? No. He is righteous. It's the only way he can do it. He's going to bless when you obey. Vengeance and destruction is going to come when we disobey. This is why we have to conquer all sin in our life. Well, we need to get on the offensive against the enemy. So when you're right with the Lord and you get on the offensive, you're going to be executing the vengeance of the covenant by you acting on the word to see God destroy your enemies. And he'll do it. Look at here some more examples of the guys that got on the offensive. Genesis 14, 12. The enemies came in and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. There came one that escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, told him about these things. So what's he going to do? He's going to go after him. Verse 14, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued. He ran after him with hostile intent after them unto Dan. He went after him, divided himself against them. He and his servants by night smote them and pursued them into Hobah on the left hand of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot, his goods, and the women also, and the people. He got on the offensive. He took the vengeance against the enemies who had come and brought a destructive work against him. This is what God wants you to do. You are going to get on the offensive. Someone who will not get into the fight, they'll, no go, they'll go nowhere. You have to get into the vengeance aspect of the covenant to defeat the devils. Leviticus 26, verse 7, You shall chase. This means to pursue and run after your enemies. They shall fall before you by the sword. And there aren't just a few of them. Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you will put ten thousand to flight. Lots of enemies. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. And if you do this, I'll have respect unto you, which means if you won't, God will not have respect unto you. And what will he do if you do this? Not only he'll smite your enemies, but he'll make you fruitful, multiply you, and establish his covenant with you. The vengeance of the covenant will bring forth victory. The enemies will be smitten. You'll be fruitful. You'll be multiplied. You'll be blessed. You'll see the promises coming to pass. Pursuing the enemies is what must happen. We see in Judges chapter 6, Gideon was called of the Lord to take vengeance against these enemies. Here's when the angel comes to Gideon. He's threshing by the wine press, and they're in bondage to the, enemy, to the Midianites. Angel Lord, in verse 12, appeared to him and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And so here he's calling out to the Lord, about what, what all had happened, and he's thinking that the Lord forsook them. The Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianites. He's saying all these things. Not so. God was going to raise him up to go and to deliver them. We see in chapter 7, over in verse 3, he said, Therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. They returned to the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. That tells you something. 22 out of 32,000 were in fear. And many people were in fear and they won't enter into the fight. You have to get rid of the fear. Fear will hinder you from being able to conquer and overcome your enemies and see the vengeance of the covenant come forth. 
He said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down the water. I'll try them for thee there. This is to see if there's, they can be used of God to conquer enemies. It shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought it down the people in the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. The number of those that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. That meant they didn't stick their head down in the water. They brought the water up to their mouth, meaning they were watching as they were drinking. All the rest of the people bowed down their knees to drink water. Well, they wouldn't be able to watch the enemy. The point being, the ones who are not watching, are they fit for the battle? No. The Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let all the other people go every man into his place. They weren't fit for the battle. Only three hundred out of thirty-two thousand were fit. But the three hundred was all that he needed he had to have those who were not going to have fear and were not going to be not those that wouldn't watch because you've got to be watchful uh, to conquer the enemies that would come against you. Well, he sent them against them. We come down to verse 23. The men of Israel gathered themselves together and they went after them, pursued after the Midianites, it says, sent messengers against them, and they came down against them, took them before the waters, all the men gathered themselves and took, took all these ones against them. And they pursued them. They began to slay. If you read through this, all these ones, they slew every single one of them. They pursued Midianite, brought the heads of these kings, as Oreb and Zeb, to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. They smote them all. They went after him. This was the vengeance of the Lord against the enemies. That's what God wants. But you've got to meet the conditions. Even if you have sinned and now you're in bondage because you've given place to the devil, well, confess your sin, turn, and God will raise you up again. Judges chapter 16, remember Samson? And he didn't do the right thing. He ended up losing his sight. He ended up being in the prison under the Philistines' control. Samson called the Lord and said, I, O Lord God, I remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes, that he might take vengeance against them. If, if you've gotten into a place where the devil's come in and he's destroyed a whole lot of things in your life, and maybe you've got to the place where you're so bound, him losing his eyes would be a type of people not being able to see spiritually. So they're so bound they can't even see spiritually what's going on. That they, They're really bound. Well, God will strengthen you if you get in the Word. And he'll open your eyes. And you'll be able to have the spiritual strength again to conquer the enemies. And he did. He was able to conquer them. He avenged the Philistines and brought destruction against them. Really, this is somewhat a type of the church that is has gone into not really walking in the ways of the Lord. I'm talking about overall. They're going to be strengthened one more time to conquer the enemies because the church that's going to be meeting the Lord is going to be a glorious church that is going to be mighty, is going to be doing miraculous works, it's going to be a glorious church that will conquer the enemies and see vi tremendous victory in their life, just like they saw in the book of Acts. It's going to happen again. The church will be more glorious before the end comes. God wants you to be a part of that church. At the same time, you've got to follow everything that God tells you to do. You can't just do it your way. It's not going to work. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Speaking of Saul, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over the people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. You've got to do all that he says. You can't just do what you want. The Lord host said, I remember that Amalek, what Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when you came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek. This is the vengeance of the Lord for what Amalek had done, see? And utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, ass. You're supposed to smite everything. So he gathered all the people, 
Verse 7, he smote the Malachites, it speaks of here. Took Agag, the king of the Malachites, alive. Was he supposed to do that? No. Utterly destroyed all the people at the edge of the sword. Saul and the people spared Agag and best of the sheep and the oxen. Wait a minute, they were supposed to destroy everything. They were supposed to kill everything. They weren't supposed to bring any of this. And the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good would not utterly destroy them. Did he follow the Lord on everything he told him to do? No, he just did it his own way. You can't do things your own way. You've got to do everything that he says. They destroyed everything that was vile and refuse, but they, not the things that they thought were good. They were in compromise. Well, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, and he comes and he says to him in verse 13, Samuel come to Saul, and Saul said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> no, he didn't. Samuel said, what means then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the low end of the oxen which I hear? They were all supposed to be destroyed. This means essentially you can't destroy what you want and then not destroy everything that's not of the Lord in your life. You know, well, I destroyed some of these things, but I want to keep these other areas over here. No, you got to do it all. You can't just play pick and choose with what you're going to destroy. You've got to get rid of it all. Saul said, They brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice the Lord thy God, and the rest we've utterly destroyed. <laughs> Samuel said to Saul, Stay, and I'll tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said, Say on. Samuel said, When thou wast little in thy own sight, was not thou made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? Sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Malachites, fight against them till they're consumed. Wherefore didst thou not obey the Lord? You did fly upon the spoil, didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Samuel tries to, Saul tries to argue with him, saying, Yea, I obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Malachites. He wasn't supposed to bring them, he was supposed to destroy them all. And then, of course, he wants to cast the blame. Many people don't want to deal with all the problems in their life. They want to put the blame on somebody else or the blame on someone, something else, why they haven't destroyed them. That's not going to work. There's no excuses. You have to deal with everything in your life. They took the spoiled sheep, oxen, the people did it, you know. The sheep are the things that should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice in the Lord thy God and to Gilgal. Samuel said, As the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. Rebellion, which is what it is, which means if you don't deal with all the areas of your life, you're in rebellion. Well, I've been obedient. Uh, you can't, you've got to get rid of everything that he says. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, because what is the sin of witchcraft? Witchcraft is I'm going to be in control. It's controlling. People that are controlled, I'm going to be in control of what I want. They're in, witchcraft. They're in rebellion, and that's a sin, as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. That means you're really running the show instead of God. We can't have rebellion. We can't have stubbornness in our life. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected thee from being king. What does that mean? You're not going to be able to rule and reign over your enemies. Your kingship just went right out the window because you won't do what God told you to do. He confesses, he says, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the command of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Again, he's passing the buck. You can't be blaming anything. You've got to take a good look and deal with everything yourself. There is no, no excuse for not obeying what God says. He's asking him to pardon his sin, turn again. Sam, Samuel says to Saul, I'll not return with thee. You rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. That is the vengeance of the covenant for disobedience because he would not do the things that God told him to do. What a mistake. And so he said, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from this day and given it to a neighbor of thine is better than thou. God wants us to make sure we understand we got to destroy our enemies. Do you think he's going to put you in a position of authority in the life to come? No way. It's not going to happen. You're not going to see that if you don't do what he says. But then we have David. David was one who obeyed the Lord, and he did what he was supposed to do. He took, 
He took the vengeance against the enemy. 1 Samuel 17, verse 23. Goliath came. He was the great Philistine, and he was the head of the armies of the Philistines. Spake according to these words against, against uh, the mall, and he was declaring these words, um, how he was challenging the people to fight, uh, is what it was back earlier. And here it says, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were sore afraid. They were afraid. Remember, can you win a battle if you're in fear? No. You're going to be taken down by the enemy. The enemy of Israel, the, these guys were totally in fear against Goliath. Verse 26, David spake to the men that stood by and said, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? What's important about that? That means he did not have a covenant with God. If you have a covenant with God, you will get the victory over the enemy if you're walking in line with the covenant. This guy did not have a covenant with God. He has no chance against God if you are right with him that he should defy the armies of the living God. We come down to verse 32. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And if you know your covenant, <coughs> you know who you are in Christ, and you're not going to back down to any enemies, you're going to bring the vengeance of the Lord against the enemies of God. And that's exactly what he did. Of course, he tried to tell him he couldn't go, but... David, he already knew. Verse 34, look what it says. David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. I went after him and smote him and delivered out of his mouth. When he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. He had already proved God in covenant relationship with him, would defeat his enemies. Well, he'll do the very same thing against this one. If you have seen that God has brought you victory over your enemies, it doesn't matter how big the enemy is, how strong he is, every single one will be smitten. And this is confidence, because he knew what God would do. You need to have confidence because you have performed the word and seen God work for you. David said, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. He knew exactly what God, that's confidence. Well, verse 38, Saul tried to arm David with his armor, put a helmet of brass upon his head, and armed him with all these things in the natural. Can you fight the enemy with these kind of weapons? No. He girded his sword upon his armor, and he was going to go, and he said he'd not proved it. David said, I cannot go with these. For I'm not prove them. And David put them off. You can't try to fight without the right armor, which is the word of God, the weapons of warfare. You've got to do it God's way. Took a staff in his hand, chosen five smooth stones out of the brook. Five's the number of grace that would bring the power of God on the scene. And he's going to shoot the stone, which sling the stone, which is the word of God, smiting the enemies, of course, who's the, who's the one who's the cornerstone? It's Jesus. You might send the word. You're really sending Jesus. And he sl sling was in his hand, and he's going to go after him to destroy him. And we come down to verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. Natural armor. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Spiritual armor. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Confidence. No question about it. You've got to have confidence that you can conquer the enemy. And that comes from the word of God, knowing who you are in Christ and the fact that he's given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can conquer him because you have a covenant with God. I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. I will give the carcasses of the host of Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. All this assembly shall know the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle's the Lord's. You've got to always know the battle's the Lord's in the realm of the Spirit. You've just got to speak and put him in operation so that he will smite the enemies for you, and he will give you into our hands. Who's the one who gives you the victory? God does. How? 
through you putting him in operation, through the word and through the weapons of warfare. You've got to have confidence that the Lord will do this and he will do it for you. So it came to pass, and Philistine arose, came and drew nigh to meet David. David hasted and ran toward him. That means you're going to get on the offensive. You're going after these enemies. God wants you to get on the offensive and run after these enemies and destroy them. I don't care what they're doing. They may be coming at you and working against you in all kinds of ways. You get on the offensive. You go after them. You never back off. You always get on the offensive and the attack against the enemies to drive them out. That's exactly what he did. He ran after them to meet him. Put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone, slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, the stone stunk in his, stunk, sunk in his forehead, and he fell upon his face of the earth. And of course, he was killed. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling, with a stone. He smote the Philistine and slew him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Of course, he takes that off and he ends up cutting off his head. David pursued the vengeance of the covenant was accomplished because he smote the enemies of God. God's going to do the very same thing for you. You need to have a covenant with God and have confidence, no fear, proved what God will do for you. He will conquer your enemies. You're going to run after them. You're not going to back off. You are going to use spiritual weapons and you're going to conquer the enemies and they are going to be smitten underfoot. David knew how to do this. He learned this, see? You need to do the very same thing. Well, he had later, he had to deal with another situation. 1 Samuel 30. Here's where the enemies came, and they'd burned their place by fire. And it talks about they took the women captives and carried them away. And they were all upset. Well, they come to verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the people spake a stoning him. They were looking and blaming him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what you need to do. Encourage yourself. David said to the priests about what should we do, and he brought the ephod to him, which speaks of righteousness. You have to be righteous in order to be able to go forth and conquer the enemy. He comes to the Lord and says, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? He answered, he said, Pursue, run after him with hostile intent. Thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. That's what God wants. You get on the offense. You have to have a take it to the enemy. I will not be denied faith attitude, warring a good warfare against the enemies. That's what it takes. 2 Samuel, chapter 23. Here is Eleazar, one of the mighty men of David. The son of Dodo, one of the mighty three men of David, three mighty men of David, defied the Philistines. They were gathered together to battle. The Philistines are coming against him. All these enemies are, might be coming against you. What are you going to do about it? He arose. He smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. A lot of smiting, because there's a lot of enemies that have to be put underfoot. His hand clave under the sword. He never stopped putting his sword in operation, which he never stopped, your mouth, speaking, conquering, casting out, destroying the enemies. The Lord brought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Just look what Jesus did. Jesus went and destroyed the works of the devil. He's casting out the demons, healing the sick, destroying every work, raising the dead, anything that the devil had done. He conquered them all. In the book of Acts, Remember that Paul had to learn all these things. At first he was getting beat up by the devil, run out of town, thrown out, left for dead, stoned, all kinds of destructive things, looking to God to get rid of his problem. God said, my grace is sufficient for you to be able to ward off and defend yourself and conquer your enemies. And we see this in doing this in Acts chapter 13. Did he run from these enemies this time? No. There's a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. His name was Bar-Jesus. He was with a deputy of the country. Notice as well, this guy was a Jew, and yet he was a false prophet involved in sorcery. He was way off base. He called for the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. He called for Barnabas and Saul. He wanted to hear the word of God. Well, that was a good thing. But Elimus the sorcerer withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. That means the devil's trying to stop 
something from happening. What are you going to do? You're going to back off and run away? No. Saul, who's called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. You need to get filled up with the Holy Spirit through prayer, pray in tongues, praise, worship God. O oh, full of all subtlety and all, all for subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He challenged him. He went after him, and he declared the truth. What he was, what he was up to. Now behold, the hand of the Lord's upon thee. He's not running from his enemies; he's coming after him. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Temporary blindness comes on him. That took care of him. He took that guy out. Later on, Acts 16. This is the woman of the spirit of divination, deceiving the people to follow after the spirit operating through her. This is where the damsel possessed a spirit of divination brought her masters much gain by her soothsaying, witchcraft. Same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. And which would show unto us, the King James says, the way of salvation. Well, that sounds like she's saying the right thing. That's not what it says in the Greek. There is no the. The is a definite article. There is none. When there's not a definite article in, the, in there, it is translated a way of salvation. That's correct from the Greek. That makes a big difference. Declare unto us or show us a way of salvation, which means he's showing you a way of salvation, but I'm showing you a way of salvation too. Otherwise, many ways of salvation. What do we hear the lie today? There's many ways to God. No, they're in. They're all lies. There's only one. It's through Jesus Christ. So, deceiving the people. He's showing you a way of salvation, thinking that that's not the only way. This she did many days, Paul being grieved. What's he going to do? Is he going to let this one run him out and stop him from seeing the gospel come forth of the truth? He turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He attacked that spirit operating through her. He got on the offensive, the vengeance of the covenant to destroy the work of the enemy, deceiving the people. I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of him. And he came out the same hour. He got on the attack. That's what God wants. He wants you to get on the attack. In the area of dealing with things in the heavenlies, where these evil spirits have been operating over cities, nations, peoples, we have to get on the attack. Matthew eleven twelve, 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, now it's the New Testament age, the kingdom of heaven, it says, that's another problem with the translation. It's not talking about heaven where God is. It's plural in the Greek. The kingdom of the heavens. We can show that to you for those of you who haven't seen this. This is the word for heaven. Uranion. And this particular word, that's O, it's an R. It looks like a P, but it's an R. It's a row in the Greek, or Reynos. Notice what it is. It means heaven, and it's plural. Why was it translated singular? It shouldn't have been. It's a mistake. Young's corrects this. The kingdom or the reign of the heavens suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What's that? That's talking about the church, are the violent ones that are using force and violence for the vengeance of the Lord against these evil spirits operating in the, in the rule and the reign of the heavens where all these evil spirits are. The violent, that's you and me. We are gauging in warfare with spiritual force and violence to attack these enemies. That's what this word means. Strong, forceful violence to destroy them. In fact, this is of a necessity that you take the part of the vengeance of the covenant to attack your enemies and destroy them. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. What's the kingdom? The rule and the reign of God. Notice what it says after that. Every man, that's you and me, all of us, presseth into it, which means uses force and violence. The same word, biadzo, that we saw before in Matthew eleven twelve 12, about the violent. 
You use spiritual force and violence to enter into the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, because you're going to bring the violence of God against the enemies to destroy them. Otherwise, you are bringing forth the vengeance of the covenant against them. That's why the Bible says we fight the good fight of faith. We war a good warfare. We get on the offensive to conquer the enemies and contend with them. We see over in Colossians. Colossians, that is. When you pray, you're praying to destroy the works of the enemy. Verse 12, Epaphras is one of the aspects of it. Who's one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in the wall, well, all the will of God. You miss what's being said because they didn't translate it best. The word laboring fervently is one Greek word which means to contend with adversaries. It's translated fight and fight the good fight of faith in 1 Corinthians 6.12, same word. You're going to contend with the adversaries and you're going to fight against the enemy to destroy them. Always fighting, contending with the adversary for you in prayers. Otherwise, you're going in warfare to destroy the enemies and people's lives so that they can be perfect and complete in all the will of God. It's the vengeance of the covenant being brought forth against all of these enemies. And God wants every enemy being destroyed. In fact, we also know that the vengeance is going to come upon the nations as well in the end. Micah 5.15 I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, upon the nations, such as they've not heard. <laughs> when his vengeance starts coming on the nations, they will be blown away with all the things that are going to happen. And he is going to execute this on the nations. Look at Nahum 1-2. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. He takes vengeance. He does it in righteousness, remember. The Lord revenges and is furious, for the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Don't be afraid and think it's coming against you. It's not. You're his friends if you keep his commandments. You walk in his ways, you're going to be protected in the midst of all the attack. Remember, in Egypt, the people of God were in Goshen. They were protected. But all the rest of them got smote. They got smitten by the enemy, smote as by the, the destruction that came as he bring the wrath, the, the vengeance against God's enemies. That's exactly what he's going to do in the end. And he will bring destruction. He already did it as far as in Jerusalem when he destroyed the temple. Remember the Jews who had rebelled against God? They rejected the sacrifice of Jesus. And in rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus, which was a great mistake, they continued to offer up sacrifices for the next 40 years, from 30 A.D. to 40 A.D. Now, 40 is the number of testing. And after 40 years, it's going to be over. And it was. 70 A.D., the temple got destroyed and the Jews got wiped out because of their rebellion. That's what it's talking about in Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know the desolation thereof is nigh. That's when the Roman army showed up. They were supposed to flee out of there because of what was going to happen. These be the days of vengeance, that all things that are fulfilled, that writ written must be fulfilled. Woe unto them a child, those that give suck, and there'll be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people. And that's exactly what happened. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led a captive into all nations. That's exactly what happened to the Jews. Jerusalem shall be trod down. The Gentiles of the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And it was. They were eliminated. They were finished. Remember, they never became a nation again and because of the punishment that was upon them until 1948, all because of their sins of rebellion. This is the vengeance of the covenant coming against them. Well, God is a righteous God. He's going to, though, in the end, when he comes back, 1 Thessalonians 1, 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is the second coming when he is going to bring the destruction upon the nations that have rejected him. In flaming fire, 
taking vengeance. This is the vengeance on them that know not God, all the ones that rejected him. But also, the ones that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means if you're not obeying, you're going to be in trouble. Present tense, who are continually obeying. Because, unfortunately, there's going to be a fall-away group, remember? But the ones who are following him, we're going to be the ones that are going to be obedient, and we're going to be protected. The vengeance will come. It is God's righteous vengeance. According to the word of God, the vengeance of the covenant to bring destruction on all those that will not follow the way of the Lord. So what have we seen? We've seen the vengeance of the covenant tonight. The vengeance of the covenant is part of the redeeming work of the Lord. This vengeance of the covenant works in our life for the destruction of the enemies in our life. As you and I meet the conditions, walking in his ways, we get strong, we have no fear, we're going to be obedient to his word, we're not going to sin willfully, we're going to have true repentance in our life, we're going to govern our mind, we're going to get strong, get armed, get on the offensive, get spiritually strong, put on the garments of God, get on the offensive, be those who pray continually and attack the enemy, be in faith, and we're going to go after the enemies, we're going to resist every temptation, conquer every fear, cast out every spirit, and get set free. We're going to be righteous in soul and heart. We're going to be separate from the things of the world. We're going to have the garments of God on. And we're going to get on the offensive. We saw for situation after situation, they got on the offensive and smote all their enemies and destroyed them all. That is what God wants. You are going to engage in spiritual warfare, which is essentially executing the vengeance of the New Testament against the devil's works in your life by destroying them and seeing them all be put underfoot. Praise God for the victory. And of course the end time vengeance will be the vengeance of the Lord upon the nations and they of course will see the wrath of God and those ones will end up being destroyed. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the redeeming work of the vengeance of the covenant against God's enemies. I see God is a righteous God who will execute vengeance according to the covenant. I thank you that as I am right with the Lord, the vengeance of the covenant will work on my behalf against all of my enemies to destroy all their works in every area of my life. I will meet the conditions. I will have dealt with all sin. I will have true repentance in my life. I will govern my mind. I will get strong and put the armor of God on. I will walk in the ways of the Lord, being righteous. I will separate myself from the things of this world. I will put on the spiritual garments of the Word of God. And I will engage in offensive warfare to execute the vengeance of the Lord against all of the works of the devil that have come against me in my life. I thank you for destruction of all of my enemies. The vengeance of the covenant, they will be put underfoot. And I thank you, Lord, that your vengeance is according to righteousness. I will walk in your ways. I also understand the vengeance of the covenant will come forth in the end for those who do not know you, for the nations that have rejected you. They will see the vengeance of the Lord against the enemies of God and will bring destruction. I thank you, Lord, that I understand your vengeance, part of the covenant, which is good for me, as I walk with you, you will destroy all of my enemies. For those who reject him, it will be destruction and judgment will come upon them. I will walk with you all the days of my life. I will meet all the conditions of the word of God and walk in covenant relationship. And I will see the vengeance of the covenant 
against all my enemies. Thank you, Lord, for giving me victory and conquering every enemy in my life because I am a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. For those walking with God, this is good news as you engage in the warfare. For those who are not walking with God, they're in trouble, but it's going to happen. The vengeance of the covenant. It is for us, but you've got to get in the warfare. Don't think that it's going to happen if you don't engage in the warfare. You and I must do what he says, obey in all areas. You can't be like a Saul, just obey in certain areas. You get the kingdom taken away. We've got to make sure we're doing everything he says. Just follow everything he tells you to do. Conquer every enemy, every sin. We're not giving place to anything. Every area in our life has to be rooted out. We don't have certain untouchable areas. No. We want everything that's not of the Lord out. And we correct them all. And we destroy every enemy and pursue them all. And watch God bring the vengeance of the covenant and the absolute destruction of the devil in all areas. We'll see healing. We'll see deliverance. We'll see victory. We'll see peace. We'll see prosperity. We'll see God's blessings come as the vengeance of the covenant is executed against the enemies in our life. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word, and we will see the vengeance of the covenant on our behalf. And Father, we thank you that you are a righteous God, and we know it's going to happen upon the world who rejects you. Thank you, Father, for accomplishing your great redeeming work of the vengeance of the covenant in line with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.